name is Rochelle Cote. I am an assistant professor at Memorial University in the Department of Sociology. In this department, um, I teach um, and I do research and I'm a sociologist and so what that means is that I study social inequality. And so I have a couple of different areas of research and teaching that I like to do. The one is ethnic inequality. And so the two courses that I teach, which I think are probably most important uh, to this interview and this process, uh, the one is Ethnic Relations in Canada, and the other course is Indigenous Peoples and the City, where I look at experiences of Indigenous peoples in urban spaces. And so that's the teaching that I do, and then the research, uh, there's a few things that I work on. Um, some of it has to do with immigration. And again, looking at this idea of, you know, ethnic inequality. And so how do people of different ethnicities, um, you know, how do they collide in society and what happens as a product of that? And the other side that I look at um, basically really surround issues around Indigenous people's experiences in the cities. And the one project that I just completed was talking with Indigenous entrepreneurs who live in urban centres in Canada, the US and Australia, and finding out a little bit about what makes them successful as entrepreneurs in urban spaces, but also how living and working in urban spaces impacts their identity, impacts their relationship within Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. And the other project that I work on, uh, which I'm particularly found fond of, and we're just starting to get really going now, is trying to compile and document the Indigenous history of St. John's, Newfoundland. It's something that hasn't been done and actually was a product of the course that I teach on Indigenous peoples in the city as well. So that's a little bit about what I do. So the way that universities like to talk about success in courses is in numbers. So how many students do I have enrolling in the course? That to universities is important. What's also important to universities is they're looking at the average of marks that students are getting in the course. Um, to me, I think enrollment is an important indicator of what's going on because if I get more students in my course, it means that hopefully I'm doing something right that students want to be a part of. But to my mind, something that's more important than just looking at enrollment is looking at the number of Indigenous students that I have in my course. And what I have seen over the past three years is a rise in the number of Indigenous students. And to my mind, it makes me incredibly happy to see that, given, um, I guess, the lack of Indigenous presence on this campus and what I know about how many Indigenous students feel going into courses and feeling like they are not represented and just not wanting to be here. And so the fact that I can have more Indigenous students taking this class, staying in my class and appreciating it makes me feel really, really good about what I'm doing. Um, the other measure of success that I have for this particular course is looking at the change in students from day one in September up until the end of the course, which is, you know, depending on the year, either the end of November or the end of December. Um, the majority of my students are um, white. They are from in and around Newfoundland. And their interactions with Indigenous peoples in this province um, aren't very great. Uh, nor I think are they very informative most times. And so they come into my class at the beginning of fall with not a lot of information. And the information that they do have is either negative or very stereotypical. Or they come in with the idea that, you know, Indigenous peoples just don't really exist in this area. And that's something that has been, I think, pervasive for a very, very long time in this province. And so what I look for in my students is a change not only in the knowledge that they have about Indigenous peoples in, in this area and in this province, but also in the level of empathy and the types of conversations that we can have. 
And so this past semester in particular, what was wonderful is that by the end of the semester, we were able to have these deep discussions around cultural appropriation, around Indigenous social mobility, around what it means for an Indigenous person to exist in an urban space, and how colonization and how settlers um, frame in a lot of ways that, that conversation. And we were able to talk about that and have really, really good conversations. And that is, to me, probably one of the most important things that I see as a measure of success in my course is the ability to have students who can leave my class with a greater appreciation and a more diverse knowledge set in terms of the people that are, that are living here, who maybe are or are not like them. One of the things that I started doing with this course in particular is that because it's a course on Indigenous peoples and their experiences in the city, um, I quickly decided after the first year that I taught it that sitting in a university classroom wasn't engaging my students at the level that they needed to be. And I decided to uh, contact the St. John's Native Friendship Center, which is now uh, First Light, uh, but I decided to get in touch with them and see if they would be open to hosting some of my classes. They were delighted. And so that was in the second semester, something that I started. And the second year I started doing this, I had four classes. And so the first two classes, we talked about, or I guess, it, no, it was the four classes. We spent two weeks talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we sat in the boardroom at the Friendship Centre. Uh, community was invited to participate. That is my, my steadfast rule when we do this, is that the classes are open to anybody from the community that can be um, Indigenous, that can be non-Indigenous. It's really whoever wants to show up. Um, they can just sit and listen. They can participate in the conversation. It's completely up to them. Uh, but that was what we did uh, the first year. So we had two weeks. We talked about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, we had uh, members of the Indigenous community show up who had varying experiences with residential schools, whether um, they had family members, whether they had been in the residential school system. And the level of conversation and engagement and learning that happened within those two weeks was incredible. And that convinced me very, very quickly that not only was this something that I wanted to continue doing, but now, um, I guess, my decision is trying to figure out how many classes I can get away with having um, at the Friendship Center without impacting my students um, too much because the, the Friendship Center is at a bit of a distance from, from the university. And so I need to also be aware, you know, of commuting and traveling between the two spaces, even though I, you know, I try my best to make sure that it doesn't impact uh, their other courses too, too dramatically. But this year I had... I think it was six classes at the Friendship Center. Um, and so again, uh, we had classes where we went. Um, we had very good conversations about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission again. We had another class where we talked about um, cultural uh, appropriation. And it just worked very, very well. And so this is something that I intend to continue. Um, I think it's been invaluable for my students, but I think also for the community as well. It's holding class at the Friendship Center has meant that, you know, it, it takes, it takes and it privileges Indigenous space and Indigenous settings in the learning, which I think is one of the most important things that, you know, as, as teachers and as professors that we can do is, you know, try and appreciate those spaces and ensure that the students are getting access to them as well and that the students feel comfortable going to these places too, right? I don't self-identify as Indigenous and so, you know, when I hear this term for me, you know, it, it's almost like I can, I need to sit there and say, well, you know, this has nothing to do with me, but I know in a way that it does. And so when I think about Indigenous education, I think about it in a way of how can we as settler scholars, I guess, continue to privilege other ways of knowing in our institutions. 
And so when I think about Indigenous education, to me, I think about my university and I think about my colleagues. I don't really have any Indigenous colleagues at this university. And so when I think of point number one about what ind Indigenous education means, well, Indigenous education means that we need to have more Indigenous scholars and Indigenous professors and researchers in this institution, right? We need these perspectives. We need for Indigenous students to be able to see themselves reflected in, you know, the professoriate here and the way that things are done even at the administrative level. So that's thing number one. And thing number two, when I think of Indigenous education, is, I guess, you know, looking at what I'm trying to do in terms of bringing in Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous knowledge into coursework. Um, you know, when you go to university, you are trained and educated in a certain perspective, in Western ways of thinking. But it doesn't always work so well when you're trying to talk about other groups, and it's important to bring that knowledge to the table as well and respect that knowledge and ensure that students respect that knowledge as well. And so when I think about Indigenous education, to my mind, that is, I think, what we all have a responsibility to try and, and figure out how to integrate that into our courses and to sort of bring those perspectives in because they are equally, if not more important, in, in this particular setting because students need to have access to diverse forms of knowledge. I mean, the other thing about Indigenous education is with this particular project that I have, the Urban Indigenous History Project, um, I think that continuing to document and ensure that Indigenous history of cities is written down um, publish and accessible is also incredibly important to ensuring that Indigenous education happens, right? Um, so with this particular project, what, what the hope is, is that educational institutions, government, um, community members, um, even tourists, when they come to St. John's, if they want to learn about the Indigenous history of this area, they will have a resource to be able to do that, is that there will be a database where they can go and they can have a look and, and see what an Indigenous presence in this area has looked at and ha looks like. And so in that part, even when I look over the next 10 years, is to have that database available, to have that as a resource, so that people are well-educated and knowledgeable. Is one of the things that I keep hearing, and I don't know if this is a constant across Canada, I can't speak to that, but what I can say about St. John's is that the average person here doesn't think that there was an Indigenous presence in this area. They talk about Indigenous peoples being extinct, having never been in this region, and all of these other fables, really, is what I like to call them. And so a part of having excellent Indigenous education is ensuring that people have access to good information that can then be taken to teach students, you know, young kids um, have this as a part of government programs, um, have this so that community members have a resource that they can talk about, you know, their own history in this area, I think is incredibly important as well. So, I mean, you know, I think that that's probably a part of it too, in a way. Here in this university, one of the things that is currently happening is I have colleagues, um, other settler scholars, um, because this university doesn't have a lot of Indigenous uh, professors yet. But I see, I guess, an increase in the number of colleagues who are trying to integrate Indigenous knowledge into their courses. Um, I think that, that that's a good thing. And, you know, obviously there are always ways of doing things better. I'm sure that in my courses there will, there will always hopefully be 
um, evolution and innovation happening. But I think that it's a good start. Um, I think that it's a good start that, you know, at this university, we have Catherine Anderson, who has been going and consulting with communities on how to indigenize this campus. I think that that has been a long time coming. And so I think that this is a, a good first step. Um, but I think that there's more that can be done, obviously. Um, I think that with this university, um, we, we need to be doing more. I say kind of cheekily that um, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> Um, but you know, for various reasons, obviously, you know, um, I don't necessarily want that to happen because I do love what I do. I love my teaching. I love my research. I love the people that I work with. I love the partnerships that I have formed, um, you know, with, with the Friendship Center and, you know, with, with other places here in St. John's, but also, you know, in Australia and in the U S and other places that I work, um, so, yes, I love my job, <laughs> but, uh, you know, my vision, at least for, for this university and for this area, is to try and ensure that this university has Indigenous colleagues that, that are here doing the research and the teaching that they love to do, and that and there is an Indigenous presence here that at the administrative level, at the governance level, we can perhaps see evidence that Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous knowledge are being integrated into the way that this university is being run. That we can see Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous perspectives in, in the teaching that's being done here. And that we have other settler scholars who are just, you know, integrating um, these types of things into the courses that they teach. And at some point in time, and I don't know if this is going to be in the next 10 years, but it would be great if it is, is that this idea of holding a course at the Friendship Centre is just second nature. That this isn't something that is a big production, that is something unique, that it's just, you know, something that's done, because that's just that's just what you do. That's just the way that it is. So yeah, that, that's what I would love to see. I don't know if that's the way it'll happen, but it would be great if it did. I guess that's what I am, right? Is I am an ally. I've never talked about myself in that way. Um, I have always strived to build ethical partnerships in, in my work, um, but it's always been about partnership for me. And it's always been about, I guess, taking a back seat in a way. Um, so I, I have my, my sets of knowledge. I have my research tools. I have the learning that I have. I have my areas of expertise that I know about. But when it comes to, I guess, working with Indigenous communities, I have always taken the position that I don't know anything. And so for me, I guess, being an ally, it is respecting that there are people out there that know way more than I do and wanting to learn about that and really, truly fashioning a partnership and ensuring that everybody is on equal footing and that the knowledge that other people have is equally respected along with mine. And I guess also offering the tools that I have um, for, you know, whatever purpose the community feels they need them for. And so at the end of the day, there is nothing that I will do um, that isn't focused on what the community wants and needs for me. That's, that's really, I think, that at, at the foundation of being a good ally. I'm excited about changes to let's say, the way that research partnerships are being interpreted. And so there is a lot more focus right now on Indigenous rights and Indigenous sovereignty around data. Um, so it might or may not have something to do with education, but I think that it's an important change that can potentially impact 
the indigenization of this university. But it's also a way of showing that Indigenous communities do have buy-in in terms of what universities are doing. And I think that that's an incredibly important step. And that is something that, you know, my, my university right now is, um, is trying to deal with. And also trying to develop guidelines around this idea of how to create, you know, ethical research partnerships with community. And... If you want to take that into, you know, the Indigenous education space, you know, it it has applications everywhere. Is that this all needs to be about the formation of partnerships. And it's a hard pill for a lot of university researchers to swallow in some ways. You know, we have been educated that the type of knowledge that we have is the test, like it's it's the standard, it's the gold standard for the way that knowledge is produced and the way that knowledge is consumed. So when we talk about partnership, it, it's a very different way of conceiving, um, I guess, the way that education can happen, that the way that research can happen and everything else. But I see, I see shifts happening and that is something that not only excites me, but it makes me really happy. And it makes me think that you know, the future um, is there's going to be good things that come out of that.